Disclaimer, content in this video has been created strictly for educational and investigational purposes. There is no intention to glamorise or endorse criminality or any aspect of crime. The information in this video has been acquired online from publicly available sources. Imagine a time when Scotland's most dangerous criminals walked free. Not because they were smart, but because the legal system just couldn't keep up with them. These men just didn't commit crimes, they changed the laws of their country forever. You see, the laws we're bound by today weren't established by high-ranking lawyers, elite politicians, or well-respected judges. They were established by serial killers and sometimes the wrongfully convicted. What did these notorious criminals reveal about the failures of justice. Nowadays, the name Peter Manuel is known as the last man to be hanged in Scotland. But what he isn't known for is how a combination of cunning and cruelty was enough to thwart the Scottish legal system. I'm Hawaii Five O, and this is Patsy Crime. In the 1950s, Glasgow was a city of contrasts. On one hand, it was rebuilding itself after the war, thriving with industry, but on the other hand, it was a city haunted by poverty and a rising crime rate. This was an environment that Peter Manuel thrived. During this period, Scotland's police were still catching up with modern forensic techniques, and the country was transitioning from older traditional methods of investigation to something more professional. Crime rates in Glasgow were rising, with post-war urban decay contributing to a surge in violence. This created the perfect hunting ground. Manuel. Peter Manuel was the son of Scottish immigrants who moved to the US and then returned to Scotland when he was still young. He quickly became known for his criminal behaviour. By his teens, Manuel was already getting into trouble for burglary and petty theft, but it wasn't until the 1950s when Manuel escalated into more darker crimes. Manuel was a textbook narcissist, charming when he wanted to be, but cold and calculating underneath. Psychologists now believe he was a psychopath with no empathy for his victims. He craved power and control, not just over his victims, but over the entire justice system. His ability to manipulate others and project false innocence made him especially dangerous. One notable instance of this was during a trial, Peter was accused of burglary in Bothwell, where a woman was sexually assaulted. There was eyewitness testimony, plus Manuel's previous convictions and his proximity to the crime. The evidence was stacked against him. Did he plead guilty? Nope! Peter Manuel stood in that courtroom and defended his cell. It gets better. Because of Scotland's legal system at the time, defendants had the right to cross-examine witnesses personally, which meant that Manuel was able to put the woman he was accused of sexually assaulting and robbing into the dock and then proceeded to tear her a new one. And Manuel, always confident in his manipulation skills, tore apart the prosecution's case. Now here's the twist. Manuel's legal victory wasn't because he was innocent, it was because Scotland's legal system back then didn't have the safeguards it has today. Witness protection was almost non-existent. The rules around what evidence could be used in court were flimsy. Forensic science was still in its infancy. This allowed Manuel to manipulate his way to an acquittal, even though everybody knew he was guilty. The famous phrase goes, every dog has their day. And Peter Manuel's day would soon come, but it wasn't down to a star eyewitness. It wasn't advancements in forensic technology. It would be a medal, a pearl necklace, and a pawn receipt. On New Year's Day 1958, in the suburb of Burnside, Three family members were found murdered in a brutal fashion in which appeared to be a botched robbery. Marion Watt, 45, her daughter Vivian, 16, and Marion's sister, Margaret Brown, 41, were found in their beds dead, victims to multiple gunshot wounds. At the time of the murder, the police were baffled by the brutality of the crime. There was little forensic evidence to go on, and the investigation initially focused on Marion Watt's husband, who happened to be away on a fishing trip in Ardashig at the time of the killing. His alibi checked out, and the police were left with few leads. Eventually, an eyewitness came forward to say they spotted Peter Manuel at the scene, but police struggled to gather enough concrete evidence to arrest him. Scotland's legal system at the time were heavily reliant on eyewitness testimony and confessions both of which could be easily manipulated by a skilled criminal like Manuel. But in 1958, 
After an intense police investigation, Manuel was finally arrested. His downfall came when he pawned items he had stolen from his victims, linking him to the crime. These items were a pearl necklace and medals that had belonged to the Watt family. These were easily identifiable personal belongings, and the pawn shop where Manuel had taken them had records that traced back to Manuel. Further investigations revealed that Manuel had pawned the items under a false name, but the police were able to connect him to the pawnbroker through the records and the physical evidence. The pawn tickets found in its possession were damning, as they directly tied him to the crime scene. When confronted with this evidence, Manuel could no longer maintain his facade of innocence. But during the trial, Manuel dismissed his lawyer and decided to defend himself. His courtroom antics were almost as shocking as his crimes. At one point, he cross-examined his own mother during the trial, showing his complete lack of remorse. But the evidence was overwhelming. The prosecution was able to show the pawned items directly connected to Manuel, ballistic evidence that linked the bullets used in the murders to a gun owned by Manuel, and his behaviour and patterns of criminal activity were consistent with the killings. Manuel's trial was a media sensation. The public was captivated by the details of his murders and the press portrayed him as some kind of master criminal. The media frenzy only added to Manuel's ego. He saw himself as a celebrity of sorts playing up to the cameras. We all liked that. Manuel was found guilty of the Watt family murders and seven other murders. A busy boy on Manuel, making him one of Scotland's most prolific serial killers. In July 1958, Manuel was sentenced to death by hanging. Manuel was hanged on July 11th at Berlin Prison in Glasgow, one of the last executions in Scotland before the death penalty was abolished. Apparently, there's a story of Peter Manuel was the last guy to walk to the gallows as such, and apparently he skipped up the stairs. He used to have this, these old stairs. It was D-Hall, and he's ever been in Berlin. It's in Berlin D, South Upper. I was actually in one of the hanging cells. If you're ever in Berlin, I hope you're not there for a crime you committed, or anybody else committed. Hope you're there purely on a visitational status. If you go to D South Upper, and you go to the cells along at the end, it might be number 12, and I can't remember what's up the stairs for that, but the last two, I was in one of the cells at one point, and you can see in the ceiling where they've sealed it all up, I they hung people there. And they buried them! Still buried there! You know what I mean? Just the pain of ever. Peter Manuel's trial revealed significant flaws in the Scottish legal system, particularly the lack of forensic evidence and the over-reliance in witness testimony. It was clear that Scotland needed to modernise its legal and investigative processes. Manuel's crimes pushed for the implementation of more advanced forensic techniques and better police procedures. Suppose we've all got Peter Manuel to thank for the fact that you can't uh, scratch your backside without getting a fine in public, eh? Cheers, Pedro. Now, Peter Manuel might have been a monster, but what happens when the legal system goes wrong for the innocent? What happens when Scotland's laws are used to convict somebody who didn't even commit the crime? Next, we look at the case of Oscar Slater. 1908, Glasgow was a city on the edge after the brutal murder of Marion Gilchrist, a wealthy elderly woman. But the case would become famous not because of the crime itself, but because of the injustice. Followed. Marion Gilchrist was a wealthy elderly woman who lived alone in a well-appointed flat in West Princess Street, Glasgow. She was known to be reclusive and highly protective of her possessions, mainly her jewellery, which was apparently quite valuable. At the time of her death, Marion Gilchrist was 83 years old. On the evening of December 21st, 1908, Marion Gilchrist was brutally murdered in her flat. At around 7pm, her maid Helen Lambie left the flat to run an errand leaving Gilchrist alone. Within the short span of time that Lambie was gone, someone entered the flat and attacked Gilchrist with a blunt object, striking her repeatedly on the head. Gilchrist was found lying in a pool of blood in her living room, her body battered and shown signs of extreme violence. Her jewellery box, which was thought to have contained expensive pieces, was tampered with, but strangely, only one diamond brooch was missing. The investigation into Marion Gilchrist's murder began immediately. The Glasgow police were under immense pressure to solve the case quickly. Due to the nature of the crime, robbery was assumed to be the motive and the police began searching for a suspect. However, the investigation quickly became one of the most controversial in Scottish history. The early 20th century was a time of social tension in Glasgow. Immigrants were flooding into the city 
and there was growing hostility towards outsiders, especially those seen as different. Some things never change her. This was the environment in which Oscar Slater, a German Jewish immigrant, found himself. The police initially focused on Oscar Slater, who was living in Glasgow at the time, who had a reputation as a gambler and a small time criminal. Slater had recently pawned a diamond brooch in London, which was immediately seen as suspicious, even though it was later found to have no connection to Gilchrist's missing brooch. Slater was already planning to travel to New York, and the decision to leave the country just days after the murder further raised suspicions. The police pursued him to America, extradited back to Scotland to stand trial for the murder of Marion Gilchrist. Despite the lack of solid evidence against him, Oscar Slater was arrested, tried and later convicted for the murder of Marion Gilchrist in 1908. The prosecution's case was built on weak and circumstantial evidence. Several witnesses claimed to have seen a man fleeing the scene of the crime and later identified Slater as the suspect. However, the descriptions were inconsistent and some of the witnesses were pressured by the police to point to Slater as the murderer. The diamond brooch. The police used the fact that Slater had pawned a diamond brooch as evidence of his guilt. However, it was later established that the brooch Slater pawned had nothing to do with the one missing from Gilchrist's apartment. Slater's flight. The fact that Slater had left for New York shortly after the murder was presented as evidence of his guilt even though he'd booked his passage well before the crime took place. And I know what you're thinking, that is quite commonplace. People that are maybe just a wee bit mere after them that book a flight before they go and give somebody it. That's the thing, this was a lot more difficult, especially for a guy that was a gambler and probably other kinds of addict. But anyway, despite the lack of credible evidence linking him to the crime, Slater was convicted and sentenced to death. The sentence was later commuted to life imprisonment. The media played a huge role in Slater's conviction. Sensationalist newspapers whipped the public into a frenzy, portraying Slater as a dangerous foreigner who had come to Glasgow to commit heinous crimes. Some things never change. The press coverage was biased from the start, creating an atmosphere of fear and suspicion. They made a fair trial nearly impossible. It seemed that all hope was lost for Oscar Slater. That was until help arrived in the form of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the man who created Sherlock Holmes. Conan Doyle was convinced that Slater was innocent and used his influence to campaign for a retrial. Conan Doyle's investigation uncovered several inconsistencies in the prosecution's case. For example, he found that key witnesses had been coerced and important evidence had been ignored. He also highlighted the deep prejudice against Slater due to his ethnicity and background, which had likely influenced the jury. Conan Doyle wrote a famous pamphlet, The Case of Oscar Slater, in which he laid out the flaws in the case and called for justice. Over time, public opinion began to shift and more people began to question the fairness of Slater's conviction. So in 1928, after serving almost 20 years in jail, Oscar Slater was freed. Slater's case was reviewed by the Scottish Court of Criminal Appeal and his conviction quashed. He was released from prison, though he was never formally exonerated by the court. Want to know how much they gave him? Guess. I mean, I'll give you a second. Right? Rang. Six grand. He done 20 years in the jail, but a crime he never done, and he gets six grand. That's 300 quid a year. That's not even a pound a day. Terrible. Shocking, man. Slater received six grand in compensation from the government for his wrongful imprisonment, a significant sum at the time, but hardly enough to make up for the years he lost. Less than a pound a day. I know it was in the 20s, but come on, eh? Stingy. Despite his release, the real killer of Marion Gilchrist was never found. Her murder remains officially unsolved, though it's long been speculated that the crime may have been committed by someone close to her possibly even a family member or an acquaintance with access to her home. Maybe it was Mrs. Lambie. Maybe it was her maid. I don't know. Maybe it was the police. The Oscar Slater case had a profound impact in the Scottish legal system. It exposed the flaws in the way evidence was gathered, the unreliability of eyewitness testimony, and the dangers of allowing prejudice to influence a jury. The case became a touchstone for legal reform in Scotland and contributed to changes in how criminal investigations were conducted, particularly regarding the witness identification procedures, 
in the treatment of evidence. The scandal surrounding Slater's wrongful conviction also prompted calls for greater scrutiny of police conduct and for mechanisms to prevent future miscarriages of justice. Apparently they're still working on it, but don't quote me on that. His case remains one of the most significant examples of a wrongful conviction in British history. The case is remembered not only for the horrific murder of Marion Gilchrist, but also for the injustice suffered by Oscar Slater and the subsequent reforms that helped shape Scotland's legal system into a more just and evidence-based framework. So we've seen how the legal system can fail the innocent, but what about the killers that manage to slip away? Our next case takes us to the streets of Glasgow in the 1960s, where we will hear the story of Bible John. By the late 1960s, Glasgow was undergoing a cultural shift. The city was filled with young people enjoying newfound freedom, but it was also a time of growing fear as violent crime rates rose. Dance halls like the Barrowland Ballroom were popular hangouts, but they also became hunting grounds for predators. It's a cold February night in Glasgow 1968. Inside a packed Barrowland Ballroom, is a 25 year old nurse and mother named Patricia Docker. It's a rare night off for Patricia, a chance to unwind from the pressures of work and motherhood. But by the end of the night, Patricia's escape turns into a nightmare. As she leaves the Barrowland Ballroom in the early hours of February 23rd, 1968, she is never seen alive again. The next morning, Patricia's body is discovered lying in a back alley not far from her home in Langside. She's been beaten, raped and strangled. There is no sign of her handbag or clothing and it appears that somebody has carefully arranged her body. The police arrive and quickly realise this is no simple robbery or random attack. This is brutal and calculated but there's no real leads. She had left the ballroom alone or so it seemed and the few witnesses the police question can't recall much about her movements that night. Her case, though chilling, begins to fade into the city's dark undercurrent of unsolved crimes. But this was only the beginning. Fast forward a year and it's August 1969. Jemima MacDonald, a 32 year old mother of three, decides to spend a Saturday night at the Barrowland Ballroom. Her sister warns her not to go. There's been talk of unsavoury characters lurking around, but Jemima brushes off the concerns. After all, what arm could a little dancing do? Jemima leaves her children with her sister and heads out to the ballroom. But when she doesn't return home the next day, her sister begins to worry. She hears children whispering about something awful. There's a body in an abandoned building nearby. With dread in her heart, Jemima's sister rushes to the derelict building in Brigton. There hidden in the shadows, she finds her sister's body. Jemima has been beaten savagely, raped and strangled, just like Patricia Docker. Her clothes are torn, her body is left in a cruelly staged scene. The police quickly realise the terrifying possibility this could be the work of a serial killer. Both women were last seen at the Barrowland Ballroom. Both were murdered in similar ways. Fear grips the city as the investigation intensifies. The press latches onto the story and headlines scream of a monster loose in Glasgow. But the worst is yet to come. October 31st, 1969, Helen Puttup, 29, and her sister Jean Langford head to the Barrowland Ballroom for a night out. They meet a couple of men, both named John. One is easygoing and fun-loving, but the other seems different, peculiar even. He's well-dressed, polite, and very well-spoken, but there's just something off about him. As the night winds down, the two sisters, along with the stranger, climb into the taxi to head home. In the cab, he begins talking about religion, quoting Bible verses, and lamenting the sinful behavior of the people they'd been dancing with. Jean noticed that he's almost obsessively quoting the Bible. When they drop him off near his home, Jean doesn't think much more of it. But when Helen doesn't come home the next day, panic sets in. Helen Puttock's body is found the following morning in the yard of a tenement building in Scotston, just there the water for me. Like Patricia and Jemima before her, she'd been raped, beaten and strangled. This time though, the killer had left behind a clue, a bite mark in her body. But in 1969, Forensic science was still in its infancy, and this would not be the breakthrough that the police needed. The media jumped on the Bible John case immediately. Newspapers splashed lurid headlines about a religious maniac on the loose and sensationalised the idea of a serial killer quoting the Bible while stalking his victims. The press coverage created a wave of fear across Glasgow, with many young women afraid to go out at night. 
the newspapers dubbed the killer Bible John. Gene Langford provides the most concrete description of the man, 25 to 30 years old, tall with reddish blonde hair and a Glaswegian accent. He's smartly dressed, articulate and even charming in a way, but the police can't find him. Police couldn't get him. Despite questioning hundreds of men and launching one of the largest manhunts in Scottish history, Bible John remained elusive. With no DNA evidence, no fingerprints and only a vague description to go on, Bible John slipped away, and despite the best efforts of the police, the case went cold. To this day, his identity remains a mystery. There is theories, quite strong theories, that Bible John was actually Peter Tobin. Apparently, in murder investigation, coincidences don't often occur, and there's a lot of similarities between Bible John and Peter Tobin, and one of Peter Tobin's victims that he did go to prison for, I think her name was Angela Cluck, could be wrong, I'm positive her body was found in a church, buried, he would fit the age, I may go into that further in this channel, who knows. Bible John's ability to evade capture exposed a number of shortcomings in Scotland's legal and police systems during the 1960s. Forensic science was still rudimentary, blood samples could reveal type, but not identity. DNA testing wouldn't be developed until years later. Witness protection was almost non-existent and Gene Langford, the only person who could identify Bible John, was harassed by the media and the public. Her testimony became increasingly unreliable as a result. Bible John's case changed the way Scotland handled violent crime investigations. It pushed for advancements in forensic science, like the use of DNA profiling, and led to better witness protection policies. But even with these improvements, the mystery of Bible John remains unsolved. A haunting reminder of a killer who vanished into the shadows. So we've seen how Scotland's legal system failed to catch a serial killer. But what about those that lived in plain sight? Our next story takes us into the world of organised gangs, drug trafficking and one man who had a licence to commit crime. In 1952, Tam McGraw grew up in the tough crime-ridden streets in Glasgow's East End, an area where poverty and gang culture were deeply ingrained. In his early years, McGraw was involved in small-time thefts and petty crimes, but McGraw's ambitions were far greater than petty theft. He had his eyes set on becoming one of the most powerful crime lords in Scotland. By the 1980s, McGraw had moved far beyond the petty crime and had established himself as a major player in organised crime. Focusing on drug trafficking, extortion and money laundering, his criminal empire quickly grew and his name became synonymous with fear, power and brutality. By the 1980s and 1990s, Glasgow was facing a new kind of crime wave, one dominated by organised crime. The city's poor areas were played by drug trafficking, extortion and gang violence. And at the centre of it all was Tam McGraw, often referred to as the licensee, a nickname stemming from rumours that he had immunity from police prosecution as though he had a licence to operate freely. McGraw had built his empire through drug dealing, extortion and money laundering. His influence spread far and wide from the streets of Glasgow to legitimate businesses that laundered his criminal profits. But despite numerous arrests, McGraw always seemed to slip through the cracks and that wasn't just luck. Unlike Peter Manuel or Bible John, McGraw wasn't driven by a need to kill or control, he was driven by greed and power. Psychologists would class him as a classic case of a sociopath. Someone who lacked empathy but had a razor sharp focus on their own advancement. McGraw knew how to manipulate people and systems, often using intimidation to keep others in line. McGraw's ability to evade the law wasn't just because he was careful. It was because he had powerful police friends. Police investigations into McGraw often hit dead ends and it was rumoured that McGraw had informants within the police who would tip him off before raids or arrests. One story that illustrates McGraw's cunning and influence over law enforcement involves a close call in the early 1990s during a period when McGraw was at the height of his power. The police had received a tip off about one of McGraw's drug shipments a large consignment of heroin that has been trafficked through Glasgow. A raid was planned in a warehouse in the east end of Glasgow where the drugs were being stored temporarily. The police were ready to strike, hoping to catch McGraw red-handed. The plan was set in motion 
and officers began to move in on the location, ready to seize the drugs and finally build a watertight case against the man they'd been hunting for years. But just before the raid was launched, McGraw received a phone call. A simple short message, it's happening tonight. The tip came from within the police force itself. Someone in the police ranks, possibly a high ranking officer, had informed him of the impending raid. McGraw acted quickly. Within hours, his men had cleared out the warehouse, removing all traces of the drugs and anything that could be linked back to him. When the police arrived, they found nothing but an empty building. The raid was a failure and the police were left humiliated. McGraw had slipped through their fingers once again and thanks to his connections within law enforcement, it was a perfect demonstration of how untouchable he had become. He was always one step ahead, even when the law thought they were closing in. McGraw's ability to manipulate law enforcement extended beyond just avoiding arrests. He had an intricate web of connections within the police, which allowed him to continue his criminal operations with relative impunity. He used bribes and favours to ensure that key officers would turn a blind eye to his activities or they would even interfere with investigations that would threaten him. In some cases, officers who were not in McGraw's payroll were actively intimidated or pressured to drop their investigations. The mere mention of McGraw's name was often enough to make officers back down, fearful of the repercussions that could follow if they pursued them too aggressively. It was whispered in the back rooms of police stations that McGraw had enough dirt and certain officers to ruin their careers or worse. This influence over law enforcement allowed McGraw to expand his criminal empire with little fear of retribution. Drug shipments continued to flow into Glasgow, extortion rackets thrived, and businesses paid protection money to avoid trouble. While smaller gangs and petty criminals were regularly picked up by the police, McGraw operated in a level that seemed almost beyond the reach of the law. One of the darkest chapters in McGraw's history was his alleged role in the ice cream wars and the Doyle family murders in 1984. Although McGraw was never formally charged in connection with these events, many in Glasgow believed that his influence over the police played a key role in ensuring that he was never fully investigated. The Doyle family murders where six members of the family died in a firebombing incident linked to the ice cream wars shocked Glasgow to its core. Two men, Tommy Campbell and Joe Steele, were convicted of the crime. However, both men consistently claimed they were innocent and their convictions were a result of miscarriage of justice. Over the years it emerged the investigation into the Doyle family murders was deeply flawed. Allegations of police corruption were rampant and many believed that McGraw had used his influence to divert attention away from himself and his associates. Some even speculated that McGraw had helped orchestrate the convictions of Campbell and Steele to protect his own interests. In 2004, after years of campaigning, Campbell and Steele's convictions were quashed and they were released from prison. The case remains one of the most controversial in Scottish legal history, with lingering questions about who was really responsible for the murders and whether McGraw's connections to corrupt officers helped keep the true perpetrators from being brought to justice. McGraw was a figure of fascination for the media, but his public profile was very different from that of other criminals. While some gangsters relished the spotlight, McGraw preferred to stay in the shadows. When the press did cover him, it was always about how the untouchable Tam McGraw had slipped through the fingers of justice yet again. By the late 1990s, McGraw was one of the most richest and powerful criminals in Scotland. But he continued to operate with impunity. Tam McGraw's reign finally came to an end in 2007, not because of police work, not even because of a successful assassination attempt. Believe me, there was plenty tried. What I know what got him in the end up? Natural causes. He took a heart attack. His own heart managed to take him out. He died suddenly of a heart attack, leaving behind an empire worth millions, but the damage had already been done. McGraw's legacy revealed the deep corruption within Scotland's justice system, where bribery and intimidation had allowed organised crime to thrive. McGraw's life also forced Scotland to confront the failures of its legal system when it came to tackling organised crime. In response to figures like McGraw, the country began introducing tougher anti-corruption laws, strengthened police accountability and expanded witness protection programmes. But for many, these changes came too late. So what have we learned from these cases? Peter Manuel, Oscar Slater, Bible John and Tam McGraw each revealed different weaknesses in Scotland's legal system. Manuel showed us how a manipulative killer could exploit legal loopholes. Slater's wrongful conviction showed the dangers of prejudice and rush justice. 
Bible John proved how ill-prepared Scotland was for dealing with serial killers, and McGraw's reign of terror highlighted the insidious nature of organised crime and corruption. Each of these cases pushed for change in Scotland's legal system. Tighter evidence laws, the introduction of DNA profiling, better witness protection, and tougher anti-corruption measures. Scotland today is very different from the Scotland of 50 or even 20 years ago. These criminals may have left a mark in Scottish history, but they also forced the country to evolve. And that's the real legacy of Scotland's most infamous criminals. If you like this piece of content, let me know. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've been kept interested and educated about the evolution of Scotland's legal system. If you enjoy videos like this, let me know in the comments. And if you've got any suggestions of what cases or criminals or laws or anything I could cover next, speak now or forever hold your wish. I'm Hawaii Five-O and this is Patsy Crime. <laughs>